Hey guys, this video is part 8 of the Project Gateway series. I would like to begin by saying thank you to those who pushed through the less interesting bits to get to this stage in the gateway process. While this document that I'm narrating is intentionally obfuscated with unnecessary jargon, you can still find the online CIA reading room document in the link in the description if you have any trouble understanding these complicated words. Uh, for those of you who would like to read it firsthand, it's there for free. These videos are designed to paint a picture to help explain this otherwise unwieldy document in an effort to help convey these concepts which are shrouded in mystery. My name is Vegvisor. I hope you enjoy. Part 8. Consciousness and Energy Before our explanation can proceed any further, it is essential to define the mechanism by which the human mind exercises the function known as consciousness and to describe the way in which that consciousness operates to deduce meaning from the stimuli which it receives. To do this, we will first consider the fundamental character of the material world in which we have our physical existence in order to accurately perceive the raw stuff with which our consciousness must work. The first point which needs to be made is that the two terms matter and energy tend to be misleading if taken to indicate two distinctly different states of consciousness in the physical world as we know it. Indeed, if the term matter is taken to mean solid substance as opposed to energy, which is understood to mean a force of some sort, then the use of the former is entirely misleading. Science now knows that both the electrons which spin in the energy field, located around the nucleus of the atom, and the nucleus itself are made up of nothing more than oscillating energy grids. Solid matter, in the strict construction of the term, simply does not exist. Rather, atomic structure is composed of oscillating energy grids, surrounded by other oscillating energy grids, which orbit at extraordinarily high speeds. In his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, Itzhak Bentov gives the following figures. The energy grid which composes the nucleus of the atom vibrates at approximately 10 to the 22 hertz, which means 10 followed by 22 zeros. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit, an atom oscillates at the rate of 10 to the 15 hertz. An entire molecule composed of a number of atoms bound together in a single energy field vibrates in the range of 10 to 9 hertz. A living human cell vibrates at approximately 10 to the third hertz. The point to be made is that the entire human being, brain, consciousness, and all, is like the universe which surrounds him. Nothing more or less than an extraordinarily complex system of energy fields. The so-called states of matter are actually variances in the state of energy, and human consciousness is a function of the interaction of energy in two opposite states, motion versus rest, in a manner described in the following paragraph. Energy creates, stores, and retrieves meaning in the universe by projecting or expanding at certain frequencies in a three-dimensional mode that creates a living pattern called a hologram. The concept of the hologram can be most easily understood by using an example cited by Bentov, which he asks the reader to visualize a bowl full of water in which three pebbles are dropped. As the ripples created by the simultaneous entry of the three pebbles radiate outward toward the rim of the bowl, Bentov further asks the reader to visualize that the surface of the water is suddenly flash frozen so that the ripple pattern is preserved instantly. The ice is removed, leaving the three pebbles still laying at the bottom of the bowl. Then the ice is exposed to a powerful, coherent source of light such as a laser. 
The result will be a three-dimensional model or representation of the position of the three pebbles suspended in midair. Holograms are capable of encoding so much detail that, for example, it is possible to take a holographic projection of a glass of swamp water and view it under magnification to see small organisms not visible to the naked eye when the glass of water itself is examined. The whole concept of holography, despite its scientific implications, has only been known to the, the physicist since the underlying mathematical principles were worked out by Dennis Gaber in 1947. He later won a Nobel Prize for his work. Laboratory demonstration of Gaber's work only occurred years later, following in invention of the laser. As biologist Leo Watson explains, the purest kind of light available to us is that produced by a laser, which sends out a beam in which all the waves are of one frequency, like those made by an ideal pebble in a perfect pond. When two laser beams touch, they produce an interference pattern of light and dark ripples that can be recorded on a photographic plate. And if one of the beams, instead of coming directly from the laser, is reflected first off of an object such as a human face, the resulting pattern will be a very complex one indeed, but it can still be recorded. The record will be a hologram of the face.